Hi, I'm Bersabelle, a product manager at Figma, and one of the things I focus on is our extensibility platform, the APIs that let you build on top of Figma. Now, today, I'm going to talk to you about how we built this platform, the lessons we learned along the way, and how we think about its future. But first, I want to acknowledge that I get to present on this work, but so many of my colleagues, some of them pictured here, did a lot of the heavy lifting and were instrumental to helping build the initial platform. So I want to acknowledge them. And I also want to acknowledge the editor platform team at Figma, who work with me to maintain and expand this platform in addition to a lot of the back end of our editor. Now, before we talk about how Figma built our platform, I want to start with the why and why we decided to build a platform. First, we knew if we created an API for users to extend our product, it would allow us to support infinitely more use cases. Use cases such as chaining together a bunch of repetitive or rote steps that designers do throughout the design process, or quickly generating placeholder content to unblock further design exploration, importing real data into designs to create higher fidelity prototypes, facilitating developer handoff, the list goes on and on. But all of these use cases, and all of the use cases we couldn't even imagine yet at the time, required some form of extensibility. Now, I believe extensibility platforms are critical for all products, but especially for creative tools, because they, one, help users unblock themselves and fill any gaps in product functionality, usually faster than you can, and thus they expand the use cases you can support. And two, they let users fully optimize and customize their flows. They let designers turn a task that might take 10 steps into one that might take just two. And we knew this would be especially powerful if we could create an ecosystem for people to share what they build with each other, as that could create real network effects for our platform. Now, the second reason we decided to build a platform is that it'd become table stakes for good design. We knew if we wanted to compete as a professional design tool, we needed a platform, because efficient design doesn't happen in a silo in one tool. It happens when your project management software and design tool and development IDE and all the tools in between can work in concert. And so after we decided that we needed to build a platform, and really it was just a matter of when and not if, we then got to thinking about how we might approach such a monumental and almost year-long endeavor. And so we started with some principles. Our principles really kept us grounded as we built. They made it much easier to make trade-offs around challenging decisions and ultimately build the right solutions for our users. Now, our first principle was that security was a non-negotiable. We wanted fine-grained control of what data an extension had access to at all times. And we wanted users to always understand what information they were exposing as well. So to as large extent as possible, we wanted to rely on browsers to enforce our security model since they have a very long history of protecting websites from reading, reading each other's data in unintentional ways. Now, importantly, this principle is a reason why plugins run in just one file at a time, as opposed to across all of a user's files, and also why they only run in a file after an explicit user action. Next, our API needed to be stable. Generally, when people are building products on top of your API, they should be able to rely on their apps not breaking. This is paramount. But this was especially important for a product like Figma, where our API and our editor are closely tied together, because we especially didn't want to run the risk of extensions breaking every time we updated the Figma application, which happens almost on a daily basis. And from observing platforms from other design tools that were unstable in this way, we knew we just couldn't compromise on this. And so this was a solvable problem, but it required a lot of careful time in designing the right API. Now, good performance was another priority. We wanted to make sure extensions could run really fast. An important nuance to this principle here is that we wanted plugins that did small and simple things to run really quickly, while plugins that do more complex operations might understandably take a bit longer. We also wanted to make sure Figma's performance didn't suffer when we introduced extensions. Even if every plugin just reduced Figma's performance by a tiny bit, once a user had installed and used multiple, that could really start adding up. Now, upholding this principle actually proved more challenging than expected. And we actually ended up doing a huge rewrite of our plugin platform halfway through our alpha, because the initial architecture just wasn't performant enough. 
In fact, we talked to our alpha users about this decision we were weighing of changing architectures and asked for their feedback. Here are some screenshots of the discussion we had in our Slack channel with our alpha users. Now, an important lesson here is in remaining focused on upholding the principles you originally defined, even if it means a considerable amount of work or even redoing some work. Now, it's important to note that this principle also required making some important trade-offs. For example, this is why we currently don't allow plugins that run constantly in the background, and also why only one plugin can run at a time in a file. Now, last, but definitely not least, ease of development was critical. We wanted to make it as approachable and as accessible as possible for people to build on our platform. And we strove to make the following true. If you could build a simple website, you should be able to build a Figma plugin. And so we relied on common web technologies as much as possible so that all you needed to build was vanilla JavaScript for the application logic and HTML and CSS for UIs. This way, developers who are already familiar with the web can get up and running really quickly. This also allowed us and our developers to leverage all of the existing ecosystem of tools, libraries, tutorials, documentation, et cetera, that already exist for web technologies. Now, if we had implemented our own API language, which we had evaluated, we couldn't have benefited from the vast existing ecosystem around JavaScript and adjacent frameworks. And ultimately, our adoption, onboarding, and users would have suffered. And to make sure the API worked well for plugin creators, we had both an alpha and a multi-stage beta program to get feedback on what worked well and what didn't. We decided early on that we were committed to really listening to our developers throughout this process. So we ended up talking to plugin creators almost every day as they were building, and we iterated very quickly along the way. And as we were putting the different pieces into place, keeping our principles and the use cases we wanted to support in mind, we ultimately landed on releasing two APIs for extending Figma. First, our REST API for exporting data from Figma files and connecting to third-party applications. We went with this first because going back to our principles of stability and performance, an external API for pulling data out of Figma was much easier to keep stable and performant than an API built into the editor. And thus, this was much less risky to launch first. We could launch with that first to unblock server-side integrations with third-party applications, while we took our time building the right implementation for a full extensibility solution. And not to mention, a REST API was a lot more differentiated compared to other design tools at the time. But after launching this API, we heard very quickly from a lot of people that they also wanted the ability to write to Figma files and create content in Figma via an API. And when looking at the use cases teams had, overwhelmingly, they were for third-party applications running in the Figma editor. And we knew this was a real user problem because there's actually an unofficial Figma plugin platform created to support these exact use cases. So that's when we started thinking about and building the plugin API in earnest to support these use cases that automate design workflows, and chain tedious operations together to improve efficiency. Now, all of this careful and principled thinking didn't mean this launch didn't come without challenges. The first was in finding the optimal developer experience for those building plugins. Now, one of the earliest alpha versions of our plugin API actually worked by developers copying and pasting plugin code directly into the Figma editor, which you can see a screenshot of here. We very quickly learned that this just wouldn't work and also just how critical a good development experience was to the overall success of the platform. Not features or functionality, but really just ease of use. So this is why we integrated plugin development into our desktop app, because that way we could access a user's file system directly where the plugin code lives to speed up the iteration process in development. And this is why you can have a developer experience more like this, with your plugin code running in an IDE, with API suggestions provided via type definition files published on NPM, all of which assist you directly while coding. Now, this focus on a good developer experience is also why we knew it was important to give developers templates for creating plugins directly available in product, and also why we released source code for even more sample plugins on GitHub, including for popular frameworks like React, Vue, and for, building, for using bundlers like Webpack. We wanted to limit the amount of RAM time and unnecessary work plugin developers had to do before they could just start creating. Now, another challenge was getting early alpha users. Now, getting any early users of an API is just challenging full stop. 
In order to get meaningful feedback, you need your testers to build something meaningful themselves, which means they need to put you on their roadmap or commit to doing extra work to test out your product. That, coupled with having an alpha version of an API, that is likely breaking almost every week, and thus breaking whatever people build on top of it. It all just compounds the amount of work you're asking for your early users to do. And so it's important to find early users who have critical problems your API solves. And to build our initial alpha, we got really scrappy and first started with direct one-on-one -on -one outreach on Twitter, reaching out to known and interested builders. And then we talked to the design tooling teams of some of our customers because we knew they needed more advanced functionality for extending their design systems. We used this method to get about 10 or so people initially testing the API. And we collaborated with them on Slack constantly throughout this process. After we had a solid foundation for the API and early developer experience, we scaled up our efforts and announced an open call for a closed beta. We actually got a ton of interest from this open call, but what's pretty normal with betas is there's a ton of interest, but not always a lot of follow through to building and then giving feedback. So we made sure to have a pre-screener where we asked interested folks to share what they were planning to build. And we prioritized access to those with concrete use cases. We were able to get the next 100 or so folks building through this process. Now, it was also challenging to create a good plugin sandbox on the web, which we needed to do to ensure that any third-party plugin code was truly self-contained and secure for our users. We really weren't able to find any other websites that had solved this problem in a way that was both secure and also didn't make the development experience cumbersome. Now, a common solution here is to create a custom coding language, like Excel or Coda, but we really wanted to enable vanilla JavaScript, going back to our principle of ease of development. So we ended up creating a custom JavaScript sandbox, which was very complex and required a couple of iterations to get exactly right. Again, we committed to our principles here, even though it was a considerable amount of work, because we ultimately felt this was the right solution for developers and users. And as some of you may know, a few weeks after initial launch, we had to completely change our plugin API tech stack because of a discovered security vulnerability, another big challenge. Now, the first choice sandboxing approach we went with had a security vulnerability, and so we ended up needing to swap it out with our next choice solution. Now, this screenshot here shows an internal message when we decided to pause the ability to publish plugins and updates to plugins in our community while we addressed this issue. Now, there are a few good lessons here. First, because we spent a lot of time up front carefully evaluating multiple solutions, when this incident happened, we had a readily available backup to implement. Second, because we developed our plugin architecture in such a way where the underlying sandboxing solution could be quickly swapped out without breaking or interfering with existing plugins, we were able to act very quickly. Because security was a non-negotiable and important principle, we knew all of this extra work was justified and the optionality, optionality was important. And last, because we were very transparent with our community by releasing a blog post where we clearly outlined all aspects of the incident and our decision-making process around it, users ultimately felt secure with our product and our decision, even in the face of a serious incident. Now, if you can read what's on the screen, it's a screenshot from the front page of Hacker News the day we released our blog post about this incident. And thankfully, the security vulnerability was never exploited. Now, fast forward over a year and a half, um, and we've grown an incredible community of over 1.7 thousand developers in our Figma plugin Slack, with even more actively building, over 2,000 public and private plugins that have been installed over 5 million times, and plugins are run on average 300,000 times per day by our users. It's pretty incredible. We've also seen some incredible plugins built. Plugins like content libraries for populating designs with pre-made content, photo editing plugins, plugins for testing designs across various environments, plugins for linting designs for correctness, and even some plugins we didn't expect at all, like Asteroids, or a plugin that lets you draw by typing on your keyboard, and even a Game Boy emulator plugin that draws every frame of scenes in a game as vectors on the canvas. Lots of gaming use cases for plugins, it seems. We've also learned a lot about the creators building plugins. First, plugin creators are incredibly committed to the community across all types of plugin creators, from design tooling teams to indie developers, even to startups building businesses on top of Figma plugins. 
Over 80% of all plugin creators are primarily motivated by helping others improve their efficiency with Figma. And you really see this emulated in the Figma plugin Slack, which is such a special place for plugin creators to share with each other, get help or feedback, and also talk directly to the Figma team. Not only do folks jump in eagerly to unblock each other, but they also proactively offer up tips and resources as well. By the way, feel free to reach out to me or any Figmate if you want an invite to the plugin Slack. You also see this commitment to the community from the fact that 70% of plugin creators share their plugins publicly to the Figma community, as opposed to just keeping them internal. We've also learned our original principles have paid off. In particular, our focus on ease of development because it's really helped drive developer velocity on our platform. We see this in the fact that 70% of creators built their most recent plugins in just one week or less. And 24% of creators built their most recent plugin in just one day. And we found that the ease of development hasn't just made it easy to build plugins, it's also encouraged recurring developer activity and repeat creation. We found that 44% of plugin creators have built multiple plugins. On top of that, 12% have created over six plugins. Again, our focus on ease of development has meant our community of developers have high velocity or active, which ultimately means more plugins for users faster. And that just means a more efficient Figma. Now, these next stats are ones I'm particularly proud of. Our focus on making our API approachable has meant our community of developers is diverse in terms of development experience to the point where 20% of Figma plugin creators don't even identify as developers. And 30% of plugin creators have just up to five years of experience with web technologies. And 12% have up to just one year of experience with web technologies. What an incredible testament to how approachable the API is. Um, and I know there's even more we can still do here. Now, looking to the future, um, as we think about what we want the next one and a half years to look like, to me, it looks a lot like doubling down on our goal of making plugin development accessible and approachable, and providing an even better development experience while continuing to expand the capabilities and functionality of our platform. That was a mouthful. In short, we want to expand what you can do with our APIs while at the same time making it easier to use them. Code and plugin development can be extremely powerful tools for automating the creative process, and we want to work to ensure every Figma user has the opportunity to use this tool if they so wish. We want to do this by providing more resources to plugin creators as they create. We were scrappy in the first year or so of our platform, and our community has been great in supporting each other and providing these resources. We want to highlight and better connect plugin creators with these existing resources by the community but we also want to provide more resources directly to developers and creators. This might look like code examples for very common actions, published best practices, boilerplate to make it even easier to get up and running. And of course, we also want to do this by releasing new platform functionality that simplifies development and removes complexity for plugin creators. And finally, we want to double down on the incredible developer community we've started to build and make sure that plugin creators feel recognized and rewarded for all the work they do for other creators and for our users. And I'm really looking forward to the continued partnership there. Thank you.